So there are two key questions that we want to address in the film. The first one is, whose responsibility is it to talk about death and dying? And the second one is, if we manage to do that, how do we record our wishes? It can be difficult for people. It can be difficult for health and social care professionals. I think people perhaps don't know how to start a conversation. I think sometimes people are unclear, is it my responsibility to be doing this as well? So that can be a barrier to it. And I think people often worry as well that perhaps trying to have a conversation might harm the person that they're trying to look after or upset them or upset the family as well. So there's a, a lot of reasons why people can tiptoe around this, but we do know that often that isn't the best thing in terms of getting the best outcomes for people. I think GPs have really quite an important central role uh, in helping patients when they're coming towards the, the end of their life. And I would think the first thing I would always do would be involve our district nurses who have a huge amount of experience in dealing with, with this sort of, these sort of issues and the things that arise out of them. Um, and they are often the ones who develop a really good relationship with the patient just in the, the, the last couple of weeks and uh, they're in every day, they get to know the families and they will flag up. Uh, any any problems that are that that arise. Firstly, you want to find out how much the patient knows, um, and how much they, and from then work out how much they want to know. So there there are sort of the medical side of things, and then there's a sort of more social side of things as well. And we would want to know had they any thoughts about where they would perhaps want to be when they became less well. But whatever the patient decides they want or what they would like, we would, we would really try and support them with that. If you don't know what people's fears are, you can't allay them. And, if, and sometimes they're so afraid that they can't even raise the, the subject with you. And so I think we really do have a duty, um, a, a moral and ethical duty, to kind of raise these difficult subjects. It's only in the last 60 years, really since the NHS was founded, that the general public would routinely look to healthcare professionals um, to initiate conversations about death and dying. I would say that the general public have um, a lack of hands-on experience in um, dealing with death and dying. They've lost um, some skills and confidence in this, both with their own, um, working with their own mortality and also with, um, with that of their relatives. Also there's high expectations of being cured due to the technology that's now available um, and this has contributed I think in some part to the denial that uh, society has of death. It really can be very difficult for some people to accept that nothing more can be done for them. Um, the transition from curative to palliative care can be quite challenging in that respect for some people. What we would call cu a curative to have a goal to, to be able to cure a person, to be able to restore them to a state of, of, of wellness, rel relatively speaking, within um, the context of their condition. Um, that would be curative. To move to, to um, palliative is um, to begin to acknowledge that the disease process is going to take them into the death and dying phase of their life. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't have goals set in within palliative care, you still do, in order to sort of maximise people's function and independence because they're still alive, you know, they're still living. Often challenges present themselves um, in terms of the, um, the lack of continuity that can sometimes happen with a person's care as a person is, is transferred between different specialities. Um, advanced care planning would go some way to addressing that. Um, this is a process of discussion between the individual and their caregivers and it's about their own preferences and their wishes and their values. Um, it's really designed to have a very real impact on end of life care. It's, um, it's really to ensure that they have some dignity and choice and control in what happens to them. Um, and this uh, information is passed between all the, all the caregivers that the patient will encounter. I'd just like to also mention health promotion in palliative care. Um, it sounds a little bit strange in a sense that you have health promotion in the field of death and dying, but it, it really does have a key role in opening up the concerns and the fears that um, the general public have, that um, modern Western society has around death and dying. Um, 
and it, it is it is an educational role and it is health ed education in the sense that it really empowers people to look at death, um, to tackle some of their fears around this subject. That's very important because it will help people to make choices. The reason that the families are down to us is the child has a life limit and a life threatening condition. So the challenges from the start are that, you know, as against the natural order, order of things mm. and the child isn't expected to live to adulthood. Um, so from the get go, there is the kind of the stress for families and um, for us a huge thing is that there's no two families that are the same. The, the kind of set up of families these days is so complex. Um, there's step families, single parent families, foster kids that we have. Um, so it's a really complex um, family picture and although the child is obviously at the centre of it with their own needs, um, we have to manage and meet the needs of every kind of individual within the family setup. Um, we have to look at the parents um, in terms of if as a young child who isn't, you know, maybe able to articulate their own wishes or needs. Um, so you get the parents' anxiety in that situation um, and quite often we have parents in completely different places. So one's maybe a bit more accepting than the other. Um, and getting them to communicate can be quite a difficult thing. Um, and obviously there's different stages, you know, if we can get in early when the child is referred, we can try and work away at that. But um, if the child is coming to us as an emergency, we have to kind of act a wee bit quicker to get the parents communicating and, you know, even listen to each other. They're not necessarily always going to be on the same page, but listening to where each other's coming from and try and make headway with, like, what's actually, you know, facing them um, with the death of their child. Um, there's also the, the sibling um, situation, you know, um, we more often than not there are siblings in the family um, set up as well and they themselves have different needs depending on where they're placed in the family, how, how much they're involved, you know, how much their parents actually have told them, how much they've maybe picked up themselves and a lot of it can be guesswork. Um, so we've got a kind of duty of care to the whole family. Um, and the child obviously is at the centre of that as well and we've got to be able to establish how much understanding they've got. Um, there's also kind of age of consent and you know capacity and understanding to take into consideration you know because there are some young adults that we work with who maybe know more than their parents are aware that they know. Um, so we have to be able to kind of communicate openly and in a sensitive manner and make sure that we're meeting the needs of kind of everybody within the family um, and try and pull that together as much as we can and make their journey as kind of straightforward as it can be under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. It's communication and it's not just communication with the families, it's communication with us and the team and the multidisciplinary aspect of the working in the house. Open communication is a huge thing for us and we've got to be seen to be comfortable with the subject matter and talking about it and you know we are a hospice at the end of the day so we have to be you know creating these opportunities for families to talk about what is actually going on for them. Um, my role involves in physically, um, emotionally and socially supporting older people that are frail and older people with dementia. I mean it's a huge, huge big thing coming into care emotionally for family and the person involved um, and it's supporting them and guiding them through this process and being there for all their needs. Um, I'm actually a key worker, um, so when someone comes into care, a key worker is identified who is with them throughout the process. Um, we talk as soon as they come in. We, just, we discuss things like uh, if they want anything special to wear, if they want to be there immediately or in the morning, what to do with family rings, anything um, anything they want special to be with them when they go. To be involved with someone that is close to death is quite a privilege because it's usually a private affair with family and you're being welcomed into that family realm and being really leaned on by family to support them as well as their loved one. So it is a privilege and an honour to be involved in that. It's, it is the little things, it's not just about if they need help to wash, if they need help to dress and things like that. It's about do they want their makeup on, their earrings on, what way do they have their pattern in their hair, what kind of shoes they like to wear and what they like to do on a day to day basis is really important. Whether they like to get up early or they like to do activities or they just like to sit and read the paper. These things are very important. 
We um, use a process called a support plan. When they first come into care, I work on that with the person and their family and there we identify their needs that we think they need to live on a day-to-day -day basis. And it isn't just about the washing and the dressing, it's about social activities as well. And then I will meet with family as well to discuss it. If they agree with it, that's fine, they sign it. If not, we can add more to it. Someone is close to death, a GP will commence them on what we call a Liverpool care pathway. And in that, it's identified specific needs of someone that's dying, where we, on a four hourly basis, we will identify those needs and act and achieve them. If we can't achieve them, then we will call on a GP. And that form is actually kept in the bedroom of the person so family can see that all the needs are being met and if they have any questions then they can speak to us about it as well.